everybody. Welcome. So glad you could make it today. And I am so excited because Standing for Truth is on my channel today. And we have a lot in common and I'm really looking forward to hearing from him. Um, so he's going to be joining in a minute. And I just want to welcome everybody who is watching now or maybe in the future and just say everybody is welcome here. Um, I welcome people of all perspectives. And if you're an atheist and you're here, we're glad you're here. Um, if you're a Christian and you you know, don't believe in what we're talking about, that's okay too. We welcome you. And I hope you will be will just willing to hear another perspective. So welcome SFT. I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege, Rebecca. I've been looking forward to this all week. So I'll thank you so much for, for having me on. This is awesome. Cool. Me too. Well, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to know the Lord? Definitely. Definitely. Um, first off, I did share this on my channel and Facebook page. So anybody uh, from my channel or ministry in the chat, please uh, like and subscribe. Um, Rebecca, you're putting out great material. You're doing great work. Uh, so I want people to know that. Um, and uh, to your question, yeah, good question. So I a little bit about myself. I grew up as a as a Catholic. Um, I was never, I was never an atheist that never really made any sense to me. Um, even in my college years where I was more so agnostic to religion, um, I knew there was something off about Roman Catholicism, but I knew that, uh, atheism was just not, uh, not defensible, I guess you could say. Um, so that being said, I, I didn't get saved until sometime after college. And I eventually realized that Catholicism was not true Christianity, as, as you know. Uh, we could probably do an entire show on that, uh, to be honest with you, on everything wrong with, with Catholic doctrine. Uh, but I eventually came to Christ and got saved. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a long journey of watching debates, discussions, seminars, reading lots of books before I became a confident young earth creationist. So... I, I started SFT a few years ago, actually, because I saw a need, an incredible need for another strong Young Earth creation presence on YouTube. Because uh, if you were around a few years ago, debates and discussions mostly occurred on atheist dominated channels. And I almost felt when there was a creationist or a Christian in there, it was oftentimes three on one, five on one almost like a bully session I found. So I felt there was a need to have more creationists, informed creationists willing to take on these atheists and, and evolutionists. So, you know, I eventually learned how to join these debates and discussions mm -hmm. and be able to utilize everything I had learned over the years of, of what I would say pretty intense study. And eventually I realized it would be beneficial to the community if I were to also host debates and discussions in a way that is fair to whoever the debaters are, whether it's an atheist and a Christian or just a theistic evolutionist and a young earth creationist. Although I'm young earth creationist, you know, when I moderate, I want to be as neutral and fair as possible and uh, kind of make these types of discussions edifying to the audience. So to this day, I think I've hosted and moderated um, over a hundred plus debates. And I have also myself had roughly a hundred of my own debates. So it's been, it's been a fun journey and, uh, quite the, quite the adventure, Rebecca. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and for whoever's watching right now, please do, if it's my audience and you, and you haven't heard of standing for truth, go and subscribe to his channels and, and he has Patreon. You can support him there. There's um, a list of links in my, dis in my discussion section on this video where you can connect with his channels and um, website. So please do that. And um, so, uh, you know, there's, People and someone already put in a comment. Andrew put in a comment that, "Hey, this, this, this isn't really even 
um, an open question right now, whether or not, you know, we all came from a common ancestor. So basically, you know, the idea is out there that the majority of scientists or even, you know, all scientists, some people think, uh, believe in evolution. Is that true? Um, another good question. And no, it's, it's not settled. And, um, firstly, the, the most important thing to take from this, I debated, uh, an atheist by the name of Dr. Ron Garrett. Nice guy. Um, he's been on my channel numerous times. And th this was kind of one of his main arguments that the majority of scientists believe in evolution. Therefore it's not even, a question worth considering, you know, whether or not banana plants and whales <laughs> really are related. Um, but whether that is true or not, Rebecca does not actually determine truth w regarding whether or not the majority of, of uh, people believe in something. The majority has oftentimes, as you know, been wrong all throughout history. As a matter of fact, if we go to Noah's flood in Genesis, mm -hmm. That is amazing testimony to how the majority is usually wrong because the majority during Noah's day was wrong in the same way that the majority is wrong today. I mean, only eight people survived the global flood and uh, Noah had a hundred years to build the ark, hundred years to preach. And still all we were left with was eight surviving people. And sure, today we have naturalism dominating the thoughts of most scientists, right? But this is why they start their science with this basic presupposition, assuming naturalism, assuming materialism. They don't consider the supernatural. They don't start from the Bible. Most of these scientists believe the Bible is mythology or not real uh, literal history, which we can get into a little bit later. But one thing to consider, Rebecca, is the fact that most working scientists went through all their many years of, of school without ever reading one young earth creation technical paper. Most PhD scientists could not even iterate to you one basic young earth creation argument or prediction. Young earth creationist PhDs are making predictions in all fields of science, um, astronomy, geology, genetics, biology. And uh, that's the gold standard of science. And, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit later. So therefore, um, the answer is, is most scientists, they have been brought up with evolutionary science. Okay, so this isn't a big massive conspiracy. It's because most scientists working in, in the secular fields, going to secular universities, they've never actually taken the time or even the opportunity to uh, study young earth creation literature. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'd like to point out too is that um, many Christians are PhD scientists. Many PhD scientists who are Christian will admit this, Rebecca. They'll admit that the Christian worldview motivates scientific discoveries. As Christians, right, as, as you and I, we understand that God upholds the universe and therefore we should expect to find what in the universe? We should expect to find order. In the past, there have actually been uh, numerous Christian scientists and as a matter of fact, that was the norm. You know, if you were a scientist, you were also a Christian, or at least you believed in God. This was mm -hmm. almost just the obvious to, to scientists all throughout, um, all throughout history. And many of the founding fathers, and I've actually got a list of them, uh, but for sake of time, I won't go through them all. But many of the founding fathers of various branches of science were Christian. And it's only the Christian worldview that, that makes sense of science. Right? Why does science work in the first place? Well, it's because the Bible tells us how the universe is. And from the biblical starting point, we know that the universe is upheld by the power of God. So from this starting point, and that's where I start, is from the Bible, we expect what? We expect to find order. We expect to find laws. We expect to find logic, patterns in nature. So according to the Christian worldview, the universe is upheld by a mind. And there is no way, if there's any atheists in the chat, there is no way to explain the laws of logic, the laws of nature, and so on without the Christian God. Um, would you agree with most of that, Rebecca? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, I, I agree. I don't see the universe coming into existence 
um, on its own or from nothing as, you know, many people believe that, you know, it, everything happened by natural processes. So, yeah. And there was a question in the chat, um, it, about my perspective. And so the reason I'm excited for SFT <laughs> to be on here today is because he actually, this is my perspective. I'm a young earth creationist. I have been for 20 years. And um, so I'm excited to have this perspective shared because I've had a lot of people on my channel who have differing you know, a different perspective. And I'm okay with that too. Um, I'm okay with Christians, you know, not believing uh, what I believe about creation. But um, so, but SFT, regarding what you were saying about young earth creationist literature, Andrew Cummings says, there is no YEC literature. What do you say about that? Well, that's a common assertion as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, as somebody who's done, you know, roughly 80 to 100 debates with uh, many of them in, uh, being with PhD scientists, you know, from various secular fields, this is definitely a common assertion. But th th that's all it is, is an assertion because creationists who have PhDs do real science. They have scientific models which uh, we can go through a little bit later as well. I've got plenty of, of slides um, to, to show you in the audience pertaining to the, the predictions that are coming out of these creationist models. These uh, young earth creationist PhDs, they're making very specific testable predictions about what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And these predictions are tested and oftentimes confirmed. And this is the gold standard of science, right? To uh, formulate a hypothesis, make testable predictions and actually test them and confirm uh, your model or rework the model. Mm -hmm. And uh, we as creation scientists, we can do and make many testable predictions from the biblical starting point, starting from Genesis and taking Genesis as a literal historical account. And uh, creation scientists do publish in the peer reviewed literature. But remember, Rebecca, there is a bias, a huge bias against creationists in many or actually most of the secular journals. It's precisely why there exists creation peer review. It's still peer review. And many of these biblical based models and these biblical based testable predictions go unchallenged. Mm -hmm. And it's the evolutionist side that is, are actually not meeting the gold standard of science because they're being challenged by many of these creationist PhDs to make better and more superior testable predictions from their models and they're not doing it. And we'll get into, I think, a little bit later uh, as to some of the reasons why that is the case. But remember, when it comes to secular peer review, you can't question the bigger picture of universal common ancestry. You can't question naturalism or materialism. Now, you can question the details. You'll find a lot of um, debate, okay, in, in secular peer review regarding the details. But they're not questioning the bigger picture. When creationist scientists come along, what they are questioning is the bigger picture. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's why, as I pointed out, there exists peer review and peer review is good. As in you have peers who review your work, make recommendations, point out things, Hey, maybe, you know, maybe this could be reworked. And then you go back to the, the drawing board and kind of rework that. But to have evolutionary based mindsets and people who hold to an evolutionary worldview and who automatically reject biblical creation to review your work. And because of their bias, it's going to be for the most part, immediate, immediate rejection. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just false when, when they make that assertion and people that make that assertion, they probably never read a young earth creation technical paper. I, I spend a lot of time reading technical papers on both sides. And uh, I'm here to tell you that the, the evolutionists, they're not, uh, they're not meeting the gold standard of science. They're actually failing at the moment. So uh. mm. now um, Andrew says the PhD scientists you've talked to SFT are almost never in the field of study related to evolution. And actually I, I, before we started, get started talking about the um, evidence for young earth, I really wanted to talk about 
some evidence against evolution because I do think there's, you know, Andrew, I appreciate your, your perspective here. And I just want you to know that I am someone who I've read quite a lot from um, evolution believing scientists and not even um, just not, not even listening to young earth creationists just by reading the evolution, the scientists who write about their own field, um, you can see the problems with their, uh, with their worldview and with what they are presenting as scientific fact. You, you can, you know, just read these entire books and, and not see evidence for evolution. And yet they hold on to this belief. Right. So is that, what is your experience with that? SFT and can you share with us some of the strongest evidence against evolution? Definitely, definitely. And to kind of comment on that first before I get into mm -hmm. some of the best evidence against evolution and to also respond to what Andrew's saying. So if I share screen real quick, sure. Um Rebecca, because one thing that the evolutionists don't seem to comprehend is the fact that there are numerous technical papers in secular journals that creationists look to and can determine that this evidence actually goes against the evolutionary model and supports the creation model. For example, I've got uh, countless papers here actually confirming predictions starting from the biblical creation model. So starting from our model, we would predict obviously that if god designed the original organisms if god created adam and eve for example then we would expect in our genomes treasure and not junk so for years and years intelligent design advocates have looked to dna sequences and elements that the evolutionists they say are either junk or genomic fossils evolutionary leftovers from past common ancestors okay they have not predicted what uh, would be understood as function, okay? But the creationists, we predict function because if God designed Adam and Eve and the original created kinds, why would he design them with evolutionary leftovers and junk? You know, if I were to design a car, then I'm not just going to have a car that's most that mostly consists of 80 to 90% useless parts. You know, most of the parts are gonna be there for a reason. So that being said, and this is just one line of evidence, we've got paper after paper in the secular journals. I've actually debated Andrew on numerous occasions, many discussions, and he uh, rarely provides an answer to this. But as you can see, these uh, papers go over um, incredible and essential functions found in uh, DNA elements uh, called retroviruses and retroviral like elements right here retroviral promoters in the human genome okay so i mean i could spend all day going into um right here regulatory activities of transposable elements from conflicts to benefits so the point is that i'm trying to make uh, rebecca is the fact that it's oftentimes the secular peer-reviewed technical papers that's helping to confirm the creation model and refute the evolutionary model. Now, when you read through these papers, okay, so for example, here's a, mm -hmm. here's a, um, from Science News, scientists identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses in, in immune response. This is exactly what we're uh, predicting from the design starting point. When you read through these papers and you get to like the discussion portion or the conclusion, of course, these evolutionists with the evolutionary mindset, they're not going to tap out and say, well, this is kind of inconsistent with our model. No, they're going to come up with a story to kind of save save the day, save the bigger picture. So oftentimes when it comes to these functional roles in these DNA elements that were once thought to be junk and useless, they'll say, well, these were, th these were co-opted, you know, these uh, incredibly functional and essential roles that are actually necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. They were co-opted at some point mm -hmm. um, in, in the history of, uh, I guess, evolution and, and common descent. But when you ask them to provide you empirical data for that, um, Rebecca, you won't get empirical data. They'll, they'll either say something like, well, it happened too long ago, or this is a rare occurrence. 
So that's the point is I want to, I want to point out to the audience, evolutionist mm -hmm. and creationist. When you read a secular technical paper, look at the data, mm -hmm. but don't blindly believe the conclusions that are being made by the, by the authors of that paper. Cause if they, if they're starting from the evolutionary worldview and the evolutionary starting point, they're going to do their best to fit, um, to fit the data in with, with, with the bigger picture that they believe to be true. Now there are a couple other papers I want to go, go into, but I'm going to save that for, um, a, a later portion of, um, of the discussion showing that there's actually secular papers, Rebecca, that have overturned human evolution. We'll get into that later. It's some fascinating data. But within those papers, if you read the discussion and the conclusions, it's nothing but rescue devices because they don't want yeah. to admit, okay, obviously this data is suggesting that humans and chimps aren't related. No, they're not going to admit that. Right. right. So they're going to say, well, maybe X, Y, Z happened in order to explain the data. But that's where critical thinking comes in, in, into play. Someone like you and I, Rebecca, we can read these papers. We can look at the data and we can see, wow, this is far more consistent with biblical creation. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we're doing. This is the last thing I'll say on this is we are and I can speak for myself. We're reading technical papers from the evolutionist side and the creationist side. But the evolutionists say things like, well, you know, creation peer review is not real peer review. So there's not real working scientists in, in the creation field. But that's why they're losing nearly every debate and discussion, because they're not staying up to date on both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, us as creationists, we are staying up to date on both sides. And oftentimes these actually, Andrew said, I never debate PhDs that are in the field. No, I've debated, for example, Dr. Stefan Frellos, his name from a couple of years ago. He's actually a retired botanist, retired. Um, he's studied evolution for years and years and years. Um, mm -hmm. So I have debated people directly in the field and, and they rarely have answers. So um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. And I love that phrase that you used. And I don't know if you're the one who came up with this, but this, I, I hear you say it a lot, the rescue devices. And that is, you know, whenever something doesn't fit their model, like you said, they come up with a rescue device. And like Nephilim Free says here, stories are always invented to fix problems with evolution <laughs> or incorporate evidence of creation. Yeah. As if it were actually evidence of evolution. It's so pitiful. And that's exactly what I found is so true. It does not matter what the evidence shows. If the evidence does not fit their model, then they just come up with a story. And the more that you read, um, you know, anything about evolution, you, you can easily see what is storytelling and like what the actual data shows. So like, it's something to pay attention to. If you're someone watching this and you really haven't looked into this much, then I recommend just becoming a critical reader of anything, any, you know, every time you see a headline that says, oh, evolution, discovery, you know, whatever is the latest um, uh, thing being promoted in popular science about, you know, evolutionary discoveries, read it critically because you're going to discover that they, they are just using storytelling and that it, there's very little um, that is actually uh, coming from data. And um, Andrew says, he's not going to change anybody's mind here. Um, <laughs> he says he means no disrespect. He's just, here to point out observations and and um andrew yeah you're you're not gonna change my mind simply because i've been around too long and i think um you know sft has too and some of the other people here um we've realized that it is storytelling so mm -hmm. but it, it, i want to let me get back to you no no no. that's good that's great point that's great i completely agree i love it um, you know what, let me share a screen again, because I just okay. have to show this, um, you know, I brought a lot of slides. So for example, uh, the topic of human evolution is a topic mm -hmm. that I've studied uh, intensely. 
Um, and I've looked at both sides and I've written uh, numerous books on and I'm actually currently finishing up a book on human evolution that I'm hoping to release in September. So I've, I've actually dug deep into their own literature, looked at their own side, watched their own lectures, and they admit problem after problem, especially when their guard is down and they don't have young earth creationists in the back of their mind. And you listen to their lectures, you'll see that they're admitting to the bushy mess that is evolution, that is human evolution, that is. So, for example, here are a few recent articles that have come about like here's a, a recent article that says in groundbreaking find three kinds of early humans unearth living together in south africa so in other words what they're finding is that there has been significant overlap okay rebecca where they once assumed the Australopithecines, right, if you're if you're familiar with Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, evolved into Homo habilis, evolved into, let's say, Homo erectus, and eventually Homo sapiens. Well, now we find three different early humans, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and the earliest known Homo erectus, which we would say are human, appear to have lived at the same time in the same place. So the point is, from a biblical creation model, these types of findings fit beautifully well. Because we would say, yes, there has been overlap. There has been significant coexistence because we don't look to a so some type of linear um, story of human evolution from pre-human ape-like creatures to, to humans. Here is a... Um, a recent article based on a technical paper where uh, some of their best so-called examples of transitional forms, okay? One of them is called uh, Australopithecus sediba, which they say is this perfect transition from ape-like creature to human. And what we find here is humans uh, missing link fossils may be jumble of species. And this is a secular scientist admitting that you know, she concludes that the spines belong to two different species. Um, right here, the pair conclude that there are not two, but four individuals in the in the re remains of uh, Malapa. So the point is, a lot of these best so-called transitional forms appear to be what's called artificial species. It's the accidental mixture of ape-like bones and human-like bones. And when you're actually looking at fossils, right, bones found in the dirt is essentially low, low quality data. You can't really get a whole lot from a bone found in the dirt. This oftentimes happens where you do get a mixture of, of different species. And they admit this in their own uh, secular journals. And then oftentimes you can read articles based on that. So point is, the evolutionists will just rework their story, right? While us as biblical creationists, we constantly are, are um, looking at, at this data every single month almost. And it's, it's helping to support our model. But then we've also got our own creationist journals where we're making predictions and uh, there's some amazing active research programs that some young earth creation scientists are doing, just confirming more and more of the biblical model. So it's actually kind of the best of both worlds. And uh, the evolutionists refuse to um, look at both sides. And I think that's why they're actually, um, they're actually failing. Look at this from a secular source. Gene mutations began showing up in the last 5,000 years of human evolution. I mean, the evolutionists are gonna look at that and they're going to completely miss the fact that, well, that that's kind of funny that the biblical model only goes back about six to 7,000 years and gene mutations began showing up in the last 5,000, uh, in the last 5,000 years. So, I mean, point is I, I could go through paper after paper, Rebecca, mm -hmm. showing from the secular side data that actually supports biblical creation that mm -hmm. if you're looking for a good laugh, Go look at the story that they concoct to explain away the data to ultimately fit it within that uh, that bigger picture that they, that they can't question. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now what what would you say to people who say that young earth creationists are just science deniers, like denying science in order to adhere to this literal interpretation of Genesis? <laughs> That's a good question and, and definitely a common, common argument. Um, I would say, actually, could you repeat that last part of the question about uh, a well, literal? Like people who say that creation, I mean, uh, young earth creationists are just denying science in order to adhere to a literal interpretation uh, of Genesis. Right, right. Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, good question. Well, first off, we don't believe, as Young Earth Creations, we don't believe in this uh, straw man wooden literalism that many old earth creationists and theistic evolutionists accuse us of believing in. Okay, we actually believe in what's called a historical grammatical approach reading of scripture. That's where we can acknowledge symbolism, metaphors, and, and imagery, but also understand the fact that when we read Genesis, okay, there is what's called, uh, Rebecca, the frequent use of the Vav consecutive, okay? To break that down, when we read Genesis and it says, and this happened, and that happened, and this happened, okay, this is indicative of literal history, literal events that happened in the past. And as a matter of fact, when you go to Genesis 1 and look at the verses after verse 2, what you see is just that, a vav consecutive, okay? And actually followed by a verb in the Hebrew word order, that indicates a sequence of events. That's what we're looking at is a sequence of events in Genesis. Therefore, this has to be read as a historical narrative, contrary to some of what I would say are compromising positions. Mm -hmm. No, the fact is, these events really took place, and there are well-known, well-studied Hebrew scholars that would agree this is the case. This has to be the case. And purely symbolic interpretations, they don't work. We also know that the genealogies take us right back to Adam, and from Adam to Jesus, right? Adam is the first Adam, Jesus is the last Adam, the second Adam. This is all real history that we are, we are looking at. And I mean, we could talk all day as, as to all the reasons why Genesis 1 to 11 needs to be understood as literal history, has to be. Jesus and the New Testament authors viewed it as, as just that, as well as just this internal consistency of Genesis that uh, demonstrates it has to be a historical nature. Uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter, uh, refers back to the global flood event. Uh, you know, we could talk all day why this local flood idea is just... Um, pretty nonsensical. Um, so yeah, we aren't denying the fact that there can be, um, th there can be moments of, of imagery and, and symbolism in, in scripture. We just understand that when we look at this, we are looking at, um, historical events. Now, when we start from the biblical starting point, we can actually make very specific predictions and retrodictions from the account that has been given to us by God, right? The special creation of Adam and Eve. We can look to the global flood. We can take the genealogies right back to Adam. Jesus Christ himself said, you know, he made them male and from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. Well, we know mm -hmm. genealogies only take us back six to 7,000 years. And we have Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Savior, saying that the beginning of creation not the beginning of the creation of Adam and Eve. No, the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. So that would have to then fit within that six to, to 7,000 years. Now, yeah, the context is talking about divorce because that's when marriage was instituted. They'll try and say, well, the context is divorce is what they'll, they'll say. Yeah, of course, we have a, a beautiful kind of lesson there about how important marriage is. But Jesus is referring back to the creation of man, the creation of which occurred roughly at the creation of the universe. If the creation of man was day six and the six days are literal 24 hour days, then that makes sense. That's still the beginning. Right. If I say, you know, the first thing I did in the morning was uh, drank a coffee. Well, that doesn't have to literally be the first thing I did. I mean, when I first got up, maybe I checked my phone, went to the washroom. Okay, all those events within the first hour of my day can really technically be considered the, the start of my day. So day six, creation of Adam and Eve uh, would technically be the beginning of creation. The old earthers, theistic evolutionists, they have a huge, huge problem with that. So uh, I guess my final response to your question, and then we can get into some of the lines of evidence. The scientific data actually confirms Genesis. When you take Genesis as literal history, the scientific data is corroborated by that. So mm -hmm. we have no reason then to force fit a theory such as universal common ancestry into Genesis where it doesn't belong. Why mm -hmm. would we ruin the Bible with, with a garbage uh, so-called theory that, that lacks evidence anyway? So, Right.
Well, Pine Creek has asked, and I think you've actually just been answering this question, but what is the creationist model of creating life? And so I think you've really kind of answered that, that, right? Is there anything you want to add to that? What is the creationist model of creating life? Well, starting from the Genesis account, we have, see, here's the thing, as young earth creationists, we can derive um, many different models from the Genesis starting point. I think the, the dominated, the dominating model currently in creationist circles is this idea based on the Genesis starting point, God said, what? Be fruitful and multiply. Okay. So if he said, be fruitful and multiply to Adam and Eve, when we actually take this to the genetics realm, Rebecca, then we would assume that God would have created Adam and Eve, which would apply to the biblical kinds, this would apply universally with what's called DNA differences, because that would allow Adam and Eve to be fruit, to, to be fruitful and multiply, but also not make clones. God didn't say, you know, be fruitful and clone yourself. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that God would have front loaded Adam and Eve with created DNA differences. So is this true or is this just ad hoc? We just making this up. Well, we can then make predictions. Okay. If this is the case, then we should expect the vast majority of our genetic sequences, genetic elements, as I was talking about earlier, they should be functional. They should be essential. They should reflect that initial created event now we like to use fancy words like heterozygosity that just means a state of dna diversity adam and eve and the biblical kinds were created in a state of dna diversity where from that starting point they could change they could adapt they could uh you know essentially not produce clones so the point is and earlier uh rebecca i showed numerous papers demonstrating just that demonstrating the amazing functionality of our genome. I mean, it was the ENCODE project that revealed, this was a secular project. They revealed that the vast majority of our genome is active. Over 80% of our genome is active. So creationist scientists are actually making testable predictions saying, okay, if we were to like knock out this genetic sequence, or if we were to look at this DNA element, it would be functional in this role and so on and so forth. I mean, we talk all day about testable predictions and these predictions are actually being confirmed more and more every day. Now, obviously we would reject abiogenesis. And in uh, one of my books behind me, actually, I um, cover many reasons why abiogenesis just needs to be rejected. It's, it's been nothing but a massive failure, chicken and egg problem after chicken and egg problem. Everything had to be created very good as the Bible says. It could not have come about from inadequacy to precision proto cell to, you know, fully working, complicated. So, I mean, one single cell is more complicated than, than the smartphones we have or more complicated than the space shuttle. And we've got, you know, a hundred trillion cells in our body. So no, these, uh, these systems oftentimes irreducibly complex had to have been created that, that way, fully working and in, and in place right from the beginning. Um, so that's, uh, kind of a working model right now that creationists are uh, looking into. And uh, it's pretty fascinating because every day we're, we're coming out with findings that, that confirm that starting point. So I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Okay. So do you want to get into sharing some of the evidence that um, the, the evidence for young earth? Definitely. Definitely. But, there is one thing I want to say. I kind of want to backtrack, um, Rebecca, because I was taking notes on some of your initial questions. And one of your question was at, near the beginning, and I think we went on some rabbit trails because there are so many good points you could talk about, right? You um, mentioned that oftentimes the evolutionists will say there's just overwhelming scientific evidence for evolution, right? Right, right. And um, you asked, what is what, what is the truth about that? And, and I want to make it clear, especially for anybody in the audience who's maybe new to this debate. Um, you will commonly hear this. This is what I heard all throughout college. But the first thing you want to do, you want to stop, right? You want to stop whoever's saying that. Okay, you want to stop them right there when they say, well, there's just so much evidence for evolution. The first thing you want to do is ask them, well, what do you mean by evolution? Right? Because depending on what you mean by the word evolution, I may or may not agree with you. As in, if by evolution you mean 
changes in allele frequencies. Allele just means, you know, a genetic variant, and we can have uh, different fre frequencies of um, different genes and populations of organisms, or just change over time or adaptation to environments, or let's say variations within the same kind of creatures, right? For example, we have been able to, as humans, we have been able to artificially select for many different breeds of dogs. I think there's about 100, 450 different breeds of dogs right now. Um, different breeds of horses. I think there's roughly 700 breeds of horses um, and cats. This is all humans artificially selecting for certain traits and genes that have been able to um, produce this type of variation in just in human history, obviously. Mm -hmm. Even the evolutionists would have to agree with that. So the point that I'm trying to make, Rebecca, is that nobody, nobody disagrees with variation and change. Mm -hmm. And I always say with ever-changing environments, organisms would then require ever-changing genomes. It makes sense from the biblical starting point that God would give creatures the ability to change. Um, this is smart forward thinking, which points us back to what? A forward thinker, which the evolutionists or the atheists typically want to deny. Um, when they deny the forward thinker, I want to point out, Rebecca, they're actually giving uh, evolutionary processes like natural selection and mutations a mind. OK, but natural selection and mutations, they don't have a mind. Natural selection actually sees the, the short term um, for the audience sake. Natural selection is really just a fine tuning mechanism to keep a species as strong as, as they can be. It doesn't create anything new and mutations typically cause damage because they'll say natural selection is going to act upon mutations, which are the result of the genetic variation. But this is negative variation. The type of variation you get from mutations, Rebecca, is the type of variation you get on your car when you park at the grocery store and somebody smacks it with, uh, with a grocery cart, right? Dents, scratches, rust marks. That's the type of variation you get from, uh, from mutations. So not very, um, not very helpful, pretty useless actually. So uh, so the point is, if that's what they mean by evolution, which they don't usually mean that, right? Uh, then we would agree with them. So but, then they yeah. would say, you know, if you're okay with change, if you think change happens, then, you know, why not, why can't these changes add up to be large changes within the organism? Right, good point, good question. Um, so that, right. So, so that would bring us then to exactly what they would say is this type of large scale evolution that says banana plants and whales are related. Okay. All life, including plants and animals descend from ultimately a single common ancestor in the past, something like a single celled organism, um, which essentially came from lifeless chemicals. So they'll say, yeah, these changes, then these uh, micro evolutionary variations that we see can add up to bigger changes, right? Take your fish to fishermen, take your bacteria to uh, a biologist, um, ponds come to people. But here's the thing is the type of changes we're getting, Rebecca, it's not what I would call vertical type changes. It's actually horizontal changes. They're downhill changes for the most part. When we see a wolf to a chihuahua, <laughs> there's been a lot of information loss. There's been a reduction in what's called heterozygosity. Like we were explaining earlier, heterozygosity means a state of DNA diversity, but then you've also got homozygosity, which means a state of no DNA diversity. And that's pretty much what you get with these changes is you are going downhill. So you're never actually going to get pond scum to turn into people or fish to evolve into fishermen through generations of losing information or damaging the genome. Because typically these mutations are actually functionally compromising to organism. You can't take two chihuahuas and over generations breed eventually a wolf. But you could technically take, you know, two wolves or two generic dogs and there would be enough information in their genomes to select for every single breed that we see today. Um, so, yeah, you hit walls, you hit barriers. There's only so much change you can have. And that change is, is typically reductive. Okay, What we actually see is called reductive evolution. We don't see uh, large scale evolution. It's not even possible. It's not the type of change that, that we see. Uh, does that kind of make sense, Rebecca? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
digital gnosis says if there's the same number of alleles and the same number of allele differences then the information content in the dna is exactly the same if there's the same number of alleles and the same number of allele differences then the information content in the dna is exactly the same um if we were to compare let's say humans and chimpanzees or humans and dogs and we were to look at the percent the, the percent differences okay we were to look at those dna differences um let's take our closest so-called common ancestor humans and chimpanzees what they actually know when they sequence the uh parts of the genome that aren't just expected to be similar but they actually consider things like gaps, copy number variations, okay? Because there's huge chunks of either genome that are missing that you can't find in chimpanzees or humans. So when you consider all these things, there's actually about 400 million DNA differences separating humans and chimpanzees. So with those differences, okay, as, as digital Gnosis is pointing out in let's say alleles, then um, you would need, according to the evolutionary model, humans and chimpanzees split from a common ancestor about six million years ago. And then you've got the human line one way and the chimpanzee line another way. You'd have to actually fix. And fix just means to be stuck in place, okay? You'd have to get stuck into place all these DNA differences. But there's what's called a waiting time problem because to fixate new, new mutations, it's called, takes a long time. In a population of 7 billion, there's almost no fixation because if I pass on a mutation to my daughter, my wife and I pass on a mutation to say my daughter or son, eventually that's probably just going to get lost down the road. It's not actually going to fixate in the human population. So hope that kind of makes sense to the, to the audience. But uh, even just a few hundred million DNA differences that separate some of these biological organisms, it's too much. Evolutionists can't account for it. There's not enough time. They would need more time than, than they even say the universe existed <laughs> to fixate that many DNA differences. So, um, yeah, that's no help to, to the evolutionist. So I, it, it's not a problem to us, though, Rebecca, because remember, from our starting point, we are saying that God front loaded most of these DNA differences into, say, Adam and Eve. So if they were there from the start, then there's no waiting time problem. They were there. And that's actually, we see evidence for that because uh, we see evidence for genome-wide functionality. So I'm trying to, a lot of this can be technical. I'm trying to kind of break it down, but uh, yeah, good question. Cool. So what did you want to share with us about like more evidence for young earth creation? Okay. So good, good question. Um, yeah, I definitely wanted to get that out of the way that when people say, you know, there's a lot of evidence for evolution, um, make sure you ask what they mean by evolution because change, yes, banana plants and whales related, no. Um, so when it comes to evidence for say young earth creation, um, oh man, we could be here for the next three hours. So I better take a sip of water, but there is, um, you can go into any field really. And my main focus is genetics. Genetics actually puts shelf lives on genomes, Rebecca. So what I mean by that is we have mutations accumulating every single generation. And since we now know most mutations are damaging, one single point mutation can kill an organism. One single point mutation can cause a disease that's not going to result in reproduction. And that's it. That's the end of that line. But they're trying to say these mutations drove a fish to fishermen, okay? single celled like organism in, into humans and whales and, and whatever. So um, it's just not possible because now we know living organisms are actually devolving. These mutations accumulate. The human mutation rate is about 100 new mutations per person per generation. So we can take this point of, let's say, most accumulating genetic load, okay? And we could take this back to a point of least accumulating genetic load that would only be a point about six thousand years ago with adam and eve where they were created with no mutations and that's what i mean by mutation accumulation puts shelf lives on genomes we actually see in the fossil record you can go back a few hundred million years and you can find organisms that haven't changed at all so according to the evolutionists there's been what's called stasis take a horseshoe crab or a coelacanth or something like that very little change in hundreds of millions of years no what we know about mutation accumulation that's not possible 
they'd be extinct. How can they have survived for millions and millions of years and also managed to filter out all these mutations? So that's one line of evidence. Does that kind of make sense that these mutations limit the lifespans of, of organisms and Absolutely. species? Absolutely. Yes. Well, what about what, um, you know, Digital Gnosis has a lot of good questions in the chat, but yeah. he asks, can mutations ever be good? Good question. So um, beneficial mutations would be what he's referring to. Um, there's been a, a study, the long-term Lensky experiment, the longest running evolutionary experiment, thousands and thousands of generations of bacteria. And what they're doing is they're looking for these types of beneficial mutations, good mutations. They have discovered that a good mutation is roughly one in a million mutations. And when you even get that one in a million, Rebecca, they're typically reductive. As in, in order to have an advantage, they're losing genes. Like bacteria are known to lose genes short term just to improve and adapt to an environment, but it's actually long term degeneration because you keep losing genes. This results in what's called a shrinking functional genome size. And to make it understandable to the audience, let's take our car and let's say for for the time being, I want to get better gas mileage. So what do we do? We're going to remove weight from the car. OK, so we're going to remove the doors. We're going to remove the back seat. We're going to remove the side mirrors, whatever you name. It. We just start removing weight. OK, temporarily, we've improved gas mileage. But overall, we're, we're degenerating the car. I mean, we're removing weight. We're not making things better. And that's what you see is, yes, you will. You can find mutations that are beneficial. OK, but oftentimes it's at the expense of genes it's functionally compromising to the organism. Sickle cell anemia is a disease. It's a deformation in, uh, in, the, in blood cells, okay? But people with sickle cell anemia are more resistant to malaria. Well, malaria is a disease that's bad. Sickle cell anemia is a disease that's bad. You don't want either. But if you get the sickle cell gene, the sickle cell mutant, okay, you're less prone now to get malaria. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't want sickle cell anemia or malaria, but there is a possible advantage to be had due to a deformed hemoglobin um, molecule. So yeah, if, if by good, you mean overall damaging. And here's the thing, Rebecca, here's the last thing I'll say to that, because that is a good technical question. We know most mutations are bad. We know Mutations are accumulating from generation to generation. So the evolutionary biologists will say, well, the beneficial mutations will counterbalance the damage. But what we're seeing here, Rebecca, is that good mutations are rare, one in a million. Typically, when we get that good mutation, it's still reductive. It's still damaging in some way. But even if we give it to them, let's just say, sure, you can have that one in a million mutation. Let's just say it's good. It's just absolutely beneficial, no harm. It doesn't matter because now we have one beneficial mutation out of a million that are bad. So that one good mutation is just going to get diluted down. It's not going to counterbalance the damage is what I'm trying to say. It's like, think of an encyclopedia, okay? And one single spelling mistake in a book of the size of an encyclopedia. On its own, it's inconsequential, but over time they build up. And maybe one day you get a spelling mistake that just turned out to make that one word better. Ooh, well, that's not going to counterbalance all the other spelling mistakes. So you can even just give it to them. Yeah, sure. Have five beneficial mutations, have 10, have 20. It's not going to help the case because organisms are still degenerating because it's a net loss. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> if you want us to believe that we all, you know, evolved from a common ancestor, then this needs to be shown to be able to happen. I mean, if we're calling it science, it should be based on observation, not based on storytelling. But, um, you know, we don't observe uh, animals, uh, systems, and becoming like, we, we don't observe them coming into existence. And if all we observe is um, small changes in organisms that don't result in new systems, then how can we call this evolutionary story um, science? That is not science. That is 
it's 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 an idea. It's one idea about how things came to be, but you can't call it scientific if you if it's not based on observation and experiment. And this is just something we haven't observed. Great points. Great points. One thing that I'll say too is, um, you know, for sake of time, I'm not going to show, but I, I could. So I've had many debates on this topic, genetic entropy, and. Um, the objections that will be put forth, Rebecca, is, well, this is just a young earth creation invention. You know, this isn't real. Well, I, I, there are countless secular papers out there from evolutionary population geneticists that are actually admitting everything that I'm saying. As in, they're the first ones to recognize, uh-oh, most mutations are actually effectively neutral, as in they only have slight effects on fitness. You know, how are we going to solve this? Or humans seem to be devolving. We've got the rise of these diseases, cancer rates are skyrocketing, autism seems to have a genetic component. We've got environmental related um, mutations as well, which is called epigenetics. We've got um, the rise of immunological disorders. I mean, it's not looking too good for the human population. I mean, we are all multiply mutant, you know? Mm -hmm. So the next time when people say, you know, SFT, you're not looking too good today. You're looking a little tired. I say, yeah, because today's the most mutant that I've ever been. <laughs> Every single mm -hmm. day we acquire more and more mutations in obviously our, our somatic cell lines. And then we end up passing some of those on from generation to generation. So we have 7 billion people on the planet, Rebecca, and every single person has mutations that they've accumulated from past generations. So for selection to ever solve this, they'd a selection would have to remove every single human being on this planet. What would that result in? Immediate extinction. Or selection can remove the worst. Let's take 50% of, of the worst mutants on the planet. Remove them. Is that going to make things better? No, because then you're left with roughly 4 billion people who are still more mutant than the generation before it. So the point I'm trying to make here is any rescue device that they put forth, you can actually just give them the benefit of the doubt and say, fine, fine, just remove the worst mutants. It ain't going to solve the problem. And this is exactly what we'd expect from the Genesis starting point, where in Genesis we read uh, of the biblical patriarchs lived into their hundreds, 100 years, 200 years, 900 years, right? How is this possible? And then after the flood, there's this significant drop off. Well, after the flood, we have massive changes in the environment, but we also know as mutations accumulate, that decreases our ability to live longer lives. And there's this perfect decay curve, actually, if you plot it out, where to deny it is to say that the early biblical authors fabricated this data that would require advanced knowledge in biology and mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> to just make up this perfect biological decay curve. So I don't know. I could talk about it all day, but that's just one line of evidence that really, really corroborates the um, the Genesis account of longer lives and uh, better health. Um, well, yeah. And the other thing, the you know, when we look at the world and the population and we look at like the, the population growth, basically it goes down to zero. Um in the thousands of years ago, not millions. And so, you know, where are all the people, if we've been, you know, even a couple hundred thousand years of humans procreating, then where are all the people right now? And when you look at what the evolutionists say about it, they say, oh, well, for hundreds of thousands <laughs> of years, our population growth was point zero 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 zero, And it goes on and on. And, and like, so it just, it gets ridiculous because even if, you know, for a hundred thousand years of procreating, even if you killed off 99% uh, percent through disease and um you know other and war or whatever then still we should have way more humans alive today than Amen. what we have this also goes for the fossil record okay take take one so-called hominid take erectus who supposedly lived on the planet for millions and millions of years did you know every single homo erectus fossil can be fit in the back of a trunk 
Even the evolutionists would agree that Homo erectus was a pretty sophisticated people. Now, they'll say a, a pre-human people, but they'll admit that they had purposeful navigation. They built uh, campsites, campfire. OK, if their generation time was roughly the same of ours, you can calculate that. We should have, you know, millions to billions of dead bodies if erectus mm -hmm. lived on this globe for millions of years, like they say. Where's evidence for their where's all the evidence for their existence? Why can you fit every single Homo erectus fossil in, in the back of, of a car? They can find a finger bone or a pinky bone. And they can tell you what that fossil specimen, what, what their family look like. I mean, the stories that they build from one single bone. I'm going to share a screen real quick just for anybody in the audience, uh, Rebecca, to make this kind of as thorough as possible. And if anybody wants to uh, email me or, um, you know, they're interested in, in these slides and this data, I'm happy to share it. So I like to leave no stone unturned, especially if there's skeptics in the audience. Everything I'm saying is backed up. If you don't like young earth creationist uh, technical work, well, you're limiting yourself for one. You're not going to go too far in the debate world. But everything I'm saying is also confirmed in the secular research, um, in secular research papers. Michael Lynch you know, well, well-known, well-respected uh, population geneticists. An average newborn contains 100 de novo. That means new mutations that were not previously there. That's exactly what I was saying. Um, right here, slightly deleterious mutations. This is Kimura. This is a paper I highly recommend um, where he talks about under the present model, effectively neutral, but in fact, very slightly deleterious mutants accumulate continuously in every species. The rate of loss of fitness per generation may amount to 10 to 7 per generation. So you can read through all these. Um, Dr. John Sanford, he's actually a young earth creationist, but his work in genetics, okay, he was an evolutionist for, I think, about 50 years till he converted. Um, he invented the gene gun, well-respected geneticist. He converted to young earth creation when he realized that this mutation accumulation problem, Rebecca, it's unsolvable. There's no answers. And every rescue device that has been, been put forth, and I could go through them all uh, for sake of time, I won't, but they've all been looked at. They've actually all been looked at in numerical simulation experiments, and they've all been, been falsified. For example, here's a number of papers. Anyone's interested, of course, they can um, email me anytime, but they've all been uh, validated in, in the fact that mutations accumulate, they degenerate, and there's no way to... Uh, stop the degeneration process. Uh, so selection can slow it down a little bit, but that's about it. It can't stop it. Here's what I was talking about earlier, Rebecca, with the um, the lifespans, this exponential decrease. If you plot it mm -hmm. out yourself from Adam to Seth down to Noah post flood, you see this exponential decay curve that maps out perfectly with mutation accumulation. And that's what I mean by you can take this back to a point of least mutation accumulation. That would be a point of what? Our early biblical patriarchs that lived and had um, longer lives. So here's the um, <laughs> coefficient p-value of this being made up, Rebecca. Less than one chance in a quadrillion. <laughs> so the theistic evolutionists or the atheists that want to deny this and say this is all just a coincidence... I mean, that is one uh, one big chance. So, I mean, mm -hmm. th there's a ton of amazing data that confirms biblical creation. There's one thing here, and I've got a thousand slides, so sometimes it's difficult. But, for example, here we have paper after paper showing that our last common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve, Okay, according to our model, that would be Eve, who was created with Adam. Okay, um, this article also noted that the new findings of faster mutation rates pointed to mitochondrial Eve about 6,000 years ago have been contributed to the development of new mitochondrial DNA research guidelines used in the forensic investigations adopted by the FBI. So the point is, these are findings in secular research papers. Now, the evolutionists obviously aren't going to tap out and say, oh, wow, every single human being today descended from, you know, mitochondrial Eve, the biblical Eve 6,000 years ago. They're not going to admit to that. So what they do is they calibrate the data with the geological column, okay, 
And to make a long story short, they're assuming deep time evolution. And what they're actually getting is a much slower mutation rate than we see today. Um, and you can actually map out, I think I have them here. So these are called phylogenetic trees. This gets a little technical, so I'm just gonna break it down easily. You can map out the genetic differences in people groups worldwide. Okay, this is a mitochondrial DNA phylogeny. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited specifically on the mother's side. Y chromosome specifically inherited by the on the father's side. These are called our uniparentally inherited DNA compartments. Okay, one compartment inherited from our dads, the other from our mothers. But what's amazing is we have actually discovered Adam and Eve, more specifically Noah. Noah would be our last Y chromosomal ancestor. We've discovered them in our genetics. And these trees are confusing, but what I'll say is there's not a lot of, of, of DNA differences here. There's not a lot of variation. All of these DNA differences can easily be accounted for in just 6,000 years. And the evolutionists, and if there's any evolutionists in the chat, I challenge them. There's no way that they can explain away this data. You've got a fast mutation rate, Rebecca, and you've got only a few DNA differences. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can have a fast mutation rate and yet all of our mitochondrial DNA and every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical is because we all descended from ancestors, a Y chromosomal ancestor and a mitochondrial DNA ancestor just between 45 and six, uh, 4,500 and 6,000 years ago. That's, that's the only way to explain this data. So this, this confirms, you know, the biblical model and the biblical starting point of Adam, Eve, and then eventually a bottleneck at the flood where earth was repopulated by three founding, three founding couples. Noah's, um, so uh, yeah. It's now there's a, the Ken has a question. He says, um, what about the Americas? We have dates farther than 7,000 years. How did that happen? Good question. Good question. So I'd recommend, I wish I could find it here. Uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. Okay, so this is, uh, let me see, he has, okay, here they are. So here's a technical paper from Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. Evidence for a human Y chromosome molecular clock pedigree based mutation rate suggests a 4,500 year history for human paternal inheritance. So Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, a Harvard graduate, by the way, by the way he took this data and He's now working, he has an active research program to see, okay, does all of human history actually fit within 4,500 years since the flood? Because we should then be able to detect genetic signatures in terms of the history of civilization, if that makes sense. We should be able to find genetic uh, signatures and markers for the, you know, the migration into the Americas or... Um, the Roman Empire, Genghis Khan's conquest, the Persian Empire, all these things has to fit within those 4,500 years. So he has come out with uh, subsequent papers. Here's one that I highly recommend everybody reads. Testing the prediction of the young Earth uh, Y chromosome molecular clock population growth curves confirm, confirm the recent origin of human Y chromosome differences. So he has actually shown that all these events, all these migration events that the evolutionists and secularists say occurred uh, far beyond the 6,000 year time um, that we have from the Bible has actually been refuted. And there's highly technical work showing this. Essentially, Rebecca, what they do is they assume population sizes, they assume archaeology, and they assume the geological column going because remember they they assume the bigger picture that evolution happened that humans right. and chimpanzees share a common ancestor but we've got young earth creationist phds that are going in and not assuming that and what we are getting is confirmation of 4500 years worth of time where we can fit the entirety of human civilization in that in that time period and i will say this this data hasn't been refuted and i challenge anybody in the chat he actually has a recent paper specifically on that. Was it the Americas was his question? Um, yeah, yeah it was about, I, he, let me find it again. It was. Yeah, I think it was. Back here pretty far. Yeah. So right. what about the Americas? Yeah. yeah. And I, so I'm imagining he's talking about just like archeological evidence that we have right. that people were living at that time. 
it's it's circular so they're assuming archaeology and then they're fitting in if they're using genetics they're first going to assume archaeology and dates derived that way and i guess that's where we can get into these these dating methods if you'd like to um and how <laughs> problematic the um the dates are if you had a if you had a couple comments i do have that you wanted to make i want to find a chart that i put together um to sure show, to show how invalid <laughs> these dating methods are uh, yeah and so uh, yeah i'll just say in response to some of the people in the chat who are just kind of calling this insanity um so like there are scientists like we were just looking at dr jensen's work and you know so this isn't just coming out of you know some like crazy person who made this up um there are scientists good scientists credentialed scientists who do not believe that evolution is scientifically viable that it's it that you know they believe that it the evidence does not support it and so um i just challenge those who are really being critical have you examined the evidence yourself or are you just like going on the basis of um what you've been taught for your entire life almost i mean from the time that we're 5 years old most of us have been indoctrinated with these ideas and that's the way it is for most scientists most scientists got indoctrinated into these ideas very early on and they never questioned them and most scientists aren't even working in the field of evolution so it you know whether or not they believe in it does not necessarily mean that the evidence supports it if that makes any sense anyway um no that makes a lot of sense and if if i could add too um as as you've seen i've shown numerous papers where this 6000 year date for eve came from secular papers um one of the most famous one is the parsons paper where they realized wow the mutation rate in the mitochondrial dna is way faster than we thought so when we actually account for the faster mutation rate and then also the number of dna differences that separate any two people on the planet eve would have lived 6000 years ago that's not young earth creationists making that up that's secular scientists um coming up with this data through um empirical science but then when you read the papers they calibrate it because that's where the assumptions come and that's why i want to emphasize this is where critical thinking comes into play from a biblical starting point we don't need to calibrate these dates we don't need to come up with rescue devices it fits nicely we have a fast mutation rate there's low genetic variation and there's actually um i'll say this this came as a shock rebecca that every single human being is 99.999% somewhere. There's low there's incredibly low genetic variation in the human population. We're pretty much the same. <laughs> we have low genetic diversity, okay? This was a shock because if evolution was true, and I'll try and break this down, if we've been evolving for millions of years, okay? We've evolved from the Australopithecines up to Homo habilis, up to Homo erectus, who lived on the planet and shared most of the globe for millions of years, which eventually evolved into Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens left Africa and spread out in all parts of the world. Well, that's millions of years of mutation accumulation, and mutations, according to the evolutionists, adds genetic diversity every single generation. So, humans, we should have had high levels of genetic diversity. Okay. So this was a shock. Now, from our starting point, Rebecca, God created Adam and Eve 6000 years ago. Okay? That really restricts genetic diversity. So from the biblical starting point, that makes sense. We are all 99.999% similar with low genetic diversity because we descended from Adam and Eve just 6000 years ago. That makes sense. So the evolutionists instead of tapping out and saying, "Wow, this is really really this is a big problem for our model." They invented a rescue device called the out of africa population bottleneck now it's really hard to find an exact date some say this happened millions of years ago with homo erectus some say it happened 70,000 years ago some say 200,000 years ago they don't really know 
because <laughs> there's no data to support it. So it's just contradictory. So they'll say there is this massive, massive near extinction event where the human population at the time shrank to between two and 10,000 people. And there were about two to 10,000 people on the globe, well, in Africa, um, for thousand years, hundred thousand years, they don't really know as much time that would be needed to restrict genetic diversity because they uh, would look to inbreeding. If you have two to 10,000 people all for the most part living in the same area, they're inbreeding. Inbreeding for one results in, in um, disease, but inbreeding does reduce levels of genetic diversity. So they'll look to this in order to explain the data, why we have such low genetic diversity. But here's the thing. They didn't predict this. They didn't expect this. They were shocked. So they invented a story. And this story doesn't even work. Because Rebecca, if you're inbreeding for thousands of years and you've got all these deleterious mutations coming to the forefront, leading to disease and genetic degeneration, that's going to result in accelerated extinction of these people. But they want us to believe that this people suddenly left Africa, exploded into all parts of the world and eventually seized dominion over the planet and invented the space shuttle and smartphones and these laptops we're talking over all through a near extinction event with significant inbreeding. So th th this is the, the, the epic storytelling. And these are the fairy tales that come out of the... <laughs> the evolutionist side. They have no explanation for that. Does that kind of make sense, Rebecca? Yeah. So Pine Creek says inbreeding results in disease. Hello, Adam and Eve. So, so yeah, yeah. I, I've had good debates that. on this. Yeah. And, and this is what happens when you don't read young earth creation technical literature. Okay. Well, what have I said numerous times throughout this program? And I tried to, to break it down in an understandable way. We look to what's called the design diversity hypothesis. More technically, it's called the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Heterozygosity means a state of DNA diversity. Adam and Eve were created with no mutations. <laughs> How would there be an inbreeding problem if there's no mutations to come to the forefront to lead to disease? Adam and Eve have no mutations. So yes, there would have been a few generations of inbreeding and it, would, it has to be the case. That's necessary. But there wouldn't be any negative effects due to that inbreeding because there's no mutations that are coming to the forefront to lead to disease and genetic degeneration. But Rebecca, yes. and I challenge digital analysis, mm -hmm. here's the problem for the evolutionists. They explain the origin of all genetic variation as what? The result of mutations. They reject design diversity. They say all diversity was built up over mutations. Okay, so we have this population bottleneck, let's say 70,000 years ago. Typically when I debate evolutionists, that's the bottleneck they look to. Uh, and they look to what's called the Toba extinction, massive volcanic eruption, drop the human population to between two and 10,000. Okay, whatever, let's, let's stick with that. So now they have the inbreeding problem because they have millions of years of deleterious mutations that have built up and are now going to be revealed. You got this hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes that are now gonna to come to the forefront leading to accelerated genetic damage. Where the creationists, we don't have that problem because we don't explain all genetic diversity as a result of mutations. Yes, yeah, some mm -hmm. genetic diversity has been the result of mutations, some, but most actually has evidence for being created. That's why most of the genome is functional, essential, beneficial, and uh, there are some deleterious mutations that have accumulated in the 6,000 years. So no, it's the inbreeding that is a problem for the evolutionists. Is, is that kind of uh, an yeah. explanation that, that makes sense? Perfect explanation. Um, <laughs> what about, um, it, Andrew is complaining that we haven't talked about common ancestry. So um, do you want to talk about that a bit? Um, well, common ancestry... <laughs> If he's talking about universal common ancestry, it's it's been refuted by the fact that uh, the mutation accumulation problem that we've been talking about puts shelf lives on genomes. So no, you don't have millions and millions of years of universal common descent taking, um, well, you'd, you'd probably start billions of years ago with your, your single um, self-replicating cell. So no, you don't have millions of years to evolve. Uh, simple organisms to more complex organisms. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA data that I have been providing 
demonstrates sufficiently that humans and chimpanzees are not related. Humans are actually not related to any other form of life. That confirms independent origins. So no, there is no universal ancestry because we've already shown that humans cannot be related to any other form of life. Also, if we were to get into the age of the earth um, arguments outside of the genetic data, Rebecca, we could look to um, many lines of evidence that limit the age of earth, uh, age of the earth. I'm just going to go over a couple really quick because we could spend three hours. Yeah. On One example is um, comets. Okay. Comets can't last very long. A comet is actually made up of ice and dirt and they orbit the sun in an elliptical path. Now, um, I had an astrophysicist, Dr. Jason Law, you're probably familiar with him yeah. on my channel going over all of these lines of evidence. So I recommend people check that out because he's a genius at this topic. But he points out that when comets get close to the sun, that icy material gets blasted out into space. In other words, comets are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're losing mass. So it has been done. We can calculate the rate as to which these comets are being depleted. And comets cannot last millions of years, okay? We've also got the rate at which, uh, we know the rate at which magnetic fields decay. And our magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field is decaying exponentially. And we can actually measure the decay of Earth's magnetic field. And if we were to run, Rebecca, Earth's magnetic field back even, let's say, 60,000 years ago, it would have been stronger than a neutron star, which is more than enough to rip the atoms of our bodies apart. So point is, the further you go back, the more problems you have for those that want to hold to deep time, because the magnetic field is going to be so strong, there's going to be massive problems to the point where there could not even be life on this uh, on this planet. And all you have to do as well is look at the sedimentary layers that extend across entire continents. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is confirmation of the global flood in Genesis because the cause of these sedimentary layers have to be global in order to explain these incredibly massive layers, literally extending continents. We've also got fossils, billions of fossils all throughout these sedimentary layers. Um, we've got marine fossils in landlocked areas that are far from the sea, far from the oceans. And when it comes to these layers, they had to be formed rapidly because we wouldn't have billions of fossils in the first place to be stuck within these layers. So, I mean, there's a few lines of evidence from geology, we've talked about genetics, and from astronomy that limit the age of the earth, limit the age of the universe, because oftentimes what the theistic evolutionists, well, actually, no, there's, there's old earth proponents that'll say, well, okay, the genetic data places Adam and Eve within 6,000 years. We can't refute this. So they'll believe in what's called a young creation, the young creation of man, but an old universe, old earth. Now, that's kind of inconsistent because why would God need this universe that's billions of years old and then an earth that's billions of years old to just bring about man 6,000 years ago? That's kind of inconsistent. But fine, if you want to give that to them, okay, now we can go to geology and astronomy and show you there. Cool. And yeah. that's where I want to go because, I, you know, Digital Gnosis says, does God just make the rocks look old as a test for the faithful? And I want to ask you about the two things that I often hear um, used, you know, just the two main supports for the old age of the earth, which, you know, a distant starlight and um, radioisotope dating. So can you talk about those Evidence Absolutely. that, mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, radio isotope dating and distant starlight. So, those are two. Um, I'll try and fit that in as best as I can, but I will point out that when they say, Did God just is God deceitful? Did he just make the universe look old? Like, if I picked up a rock, how, how, how can how old does it look to somebody? I don't have a rock next to me, unfortunately, but when you pick that up and you say, Well, that looks old, you're actually making an assumption based on the fact that, or based on the idea that we would have another earth and another universe, or we'd have another proxy to even compare our earth and universe to. We only have one universe. We only have one earth. So to me, the universe looks uh, decayed and young. The earth looks eroded, but young. We don't have another earth and universe to compare it to. So God, according to the Bible, created a functionally mature universe and earth. 
when Adam was created, if scientists would have come to Adam, let's say, I don't know, an hour after creation, and they would have looked at his height, his weight, they would have uh, done some genetic sequencing tasks, they would conclude, okay, this guy is, you know, he's been around for, let's say, 25 years. According to his genetics, he's had past common ancestors because his genetics would then reflect having a father and a mother. But no, he was created directly by God. So that would actually be a false assumption because Adam could not have been created as a zygote. <laughs> he had to be created in a state where he could work the garden. Um, point is, if you ask Adam, how old does he look? He'd have no other proxy. See, we have seen people be born. We've seen them grow to adulthood. We've seen them pass away at 80, 90. We have a proxy to tell. We don't have another universe to look at. We don't have another earth to look at. This is actually fallacious. It's a logical fallacy. So I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way. Adam wouldn't know. He wouldn't have another proxy to know what a 30-year-old looks like, what a 60-year-old looks like. So he couldn't really make that, that judgment. Um, does that kind of make sense before I move into the yeah. dating methods? Okay. Um, okay, perfect. Because <laughs> it's just, I want to get that fallacy out of the way. So when it comes to, um, when it comes to the dating methods... That is where we were going to go earlier, actually. So I'll screen share. We'll do the distant starlight one, the last. Um, we'll, we'll definitely deal with that and make this uh, as thorough as possible. But here's a chart that I have of rocks of, no, of known age. Okay, so we have rocks of known age that we've tested. And the dates that we get are, are in uh, huge error. They're vastly different than, so for example, here is the known age of certain rocks that formed, okay? Rock sample place of origin. Uh, let's say, let's do one here. Volcano in, in um, Hawaii. Known age, 200 years. They dated the rock. Look at the date they got. 160 million to 2.96 billion years. These, these are the dates being derived from rocks of, of known age. We know when these rocks were formed. Here's another one, 200 years, we got 140 million to 670 million years ago. Uh, one here, 19. Now these are found in the, in the secular um, literature. These aren't just young earth creationists making this up. So point is when it comes to dating methods, as you can see here, why would we trust the dates derived from rocks of unknown age when we can't even accurately derive dates from rocks of known age okay so there are some um huge assumptions at play when it comes to these dating methods and uh, a couple of those assumptions has to do with the decay and has the decay rate always been constant well we've actually shown in the lab now that decay rates can be sped up uh significantly um, and uh, young earth creationists would say, for the most part, that during the flood or creation event, there was some, um, some rapid decay due to the heat and pressure uh, during the flood, the catastrophic effects of the flood. But the easiest way, Rebecca, to just destroy this idea of dating methods is to point out the fact that carbon dating, radiocarbon, is pretty well the best friend of, of uh, young earth creationists because we find carbon. And, and here's the thing, when it comes to carbon 14, there should be no carbon 14 based on how quickly it decays in any samples, uh, millions uh, over a million years old, or let's say with diamonds, billions of years old, because um, for the audience sake who doesn't understand, I guess the process, carbon decays so quickly that let's, let, let's say every single atom in the universe was made of carbon. It would all decay within a million years easily. So when we test rocks or fossils or diamonds that the evolutionists say are millions to billions of years old, we shouldn't find any radiocarbon in them, right? I hope that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. It should have, have all decayed away, essentially. Um, and we have... Many PhD scientists that made up a, a group called the RATE, the RATE group, uh, radioisotopes in the age of the Earth. Okay, so this mm -hmm. is a team made up of numerous PhDs, and what they did is they sent uh, all sorts of samples to for testing, samples ranging from tens of millions of years to uh, billions of years old when it comes to the diamonds. 
And what they got was uh, radiocarbon, okay, detectable levels of radiocarbon in every single sample. Now, the rescue devices that have been used don't work either. Uh, oftentimes they'll say, uh, you know, these were contaminated, which is ridiculous because these high level laboratories, they know how to subject these samples to harsh, harsh treatments and bleach them to the point where we're looking at blank samples. So no, contamination has been looked at. And yet these results with radiocarbon are uh, repeatable. And we uh, repeatedly find radiocarbon in dinosaur bones, fossils, coal, fossilized wood, diamonds, shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be there if the earth is billions of years old. That's just one line of evidence. Um, right. Yeah, go ahead. No. <laughs> I was, but, and, and of course we have, um, you know, the, discoveries in the dinosaur bones, the, the tissue in the dinosaur bones oh, yeah. that's supposedly millions of years old and preserved for that long. That's right. That's right. I, I might as well leave no sun in turn. So the most advanced rebuttal that you'll get to the C-14 and a debate that I highly recommend, it took place recently within the last year, is between Dr. Hugh Ross, who's a strong proponent of old earth yeah. creation, and Dr. Jason Lyle. Um, they debated this topic and they got into the radiocarbon argument. And Dr. Hugh Ross brought up the argument where he said that there would be other nuclear material down where, let's say diamonds, because diamonds are the hardest substance of Earth uh, on Earth and they should be um, the most resistant to contamination. So let's look at diamonds. Why is there C-14 in diamonds? Well, uh, they'll say, and Hugh Ross said, that there's uh, other nuclear material down where the diamonds are that can recharge the C-14. <laughs> but, and, and this would technically be the best they can offer, right? But it's so funny because this has also been looked into. And what they estimated, Rebecca, is that you would need 13,000 times more nuclear material in the nearby rocks in order to adequately recharge the C-14. In other words, you would need far too much material to recharge. And I'm talking unrealistic amounts that would have to be deep down in the earth, where, as we know, cosmic rays cannot reach deep within the earth. So that C-14 should just uh, decay away. So that's their, their main rescue devices and they haven't worked. There hasn't been a good rebuttal to it, uh, Rebecca. Okay, so then, um, you know, there the only thing that they've responded to with regard to the diamonds okay so there's the recharging idea and then there's the idea that there was contamination in the experiment but both of these have shown you know to be impossible so yeah. um you know is there any other explanation being proposed um contamination the fact that nearby material could recharge the C-14 and um, I've heard the argument that maybe it's just re residual, residual uh, radiocarbon, but that doesn't work either because I've got uh, papers showing that it's sometimes a hundred times over the detectable limit. So it's not just residual. Um, really, they don't. I mean, there are very technical papers um, coming out of from the young earth creation literature addressing mm -hmm. all of this and um, I've had Dr. Jonathan Sarfati who's a PhD chemist uh, doc, uh, Professor David McQueen is our, our team geologist so we've had shows fully dedicated to this um, with um, experts on the topic too that are going to know a lot more than I do on this specific topic. Mm -hmm. So for anyone in the audience that is still not convinced, I would suggest you check those those videos out. And if you think that you do have a rebuttal, um, then feel free to send in a response. You know, we'd be happy to respond to it. But I haven't seen any any convincing arguments. And the best that I've seen have been uh, have been dealt with. And, you know, it's also, I think, worth mentioning that the presence of coal and oil all over the world is good evidence for the flood, that at one time, um, a large amount of uh, biological material was buried. And um, so, like, this is not only just the presence of carbon-14, um, that kind of shows that the coal and the oil is not millions of years old, 
you know, we have that, but it's also, you know, a, what we would might expect if all of the life that was on earth was buried rapidly. Amen. If, if I could say one thing to that, because that's such mm -hmm. a great point, um, Rebecca, is the fact that there's actually been really, really fascinating research into the rapid production of oil and coal, like, like you're talking about, as in like, in real time laboratory experiments, we're seeing natural gas, coal and oil being produced in a matter of days when it comes to coal to, to weeks. OK, and in these tests, we're finding that you can produce coal and oil quickly in a process that requires a lot of heat, a lot of heat, energy and pressure. And uh, these tests have actually demonstrated that with more heat, you'll get a faster production of coal, oil and natural gas. So point is, we find, as you're pointing out, that uh, these massive deposits of coal and oil all over the planet that the evolutionist uniformitarians would say, oh, there's no way to account for that in, uh, in a young earth time scale or a young earth creation model. But it's so funny, and I don't know, you, you may have heard of this. One of these main objections to the global flood model is that the global flood would have resulted in far too much heat, okay? That it would have boiled the ocean, it would have melted the crust, it would have uh, essentially killed Noah, killed the ark animals. But what we're now finding is this heat and energy produced by the flood you know, the natural result of a global flood as is actually a feature and not a bug, because as I'm pointing out, you can get the rapid production of natural oil, gas, and coal with heat. So if you have all this heat during the flood, then we can easily explain the massive, massive deposits of coal and oil as being the result of a global flood and the heat and energy produced at the, during the global flood would help explain the, um, massive and rapid production of natural oil, gas, and coal. And this is what I typically say is the pre-flood world being 90% green. I mean, just look at some of the fauna, look at some of the animals, how big they were. Um, the pre-flood world would have been this perfect battery that could have absorbed or sucked up a lot of this heat that was produced at the flood and utilized it for um, things like this, natural gas and oil, or been utilized to rapidly move plates because we believe in um, essentially continental sprint during the flood. And you need continental sprint. You need meters per second movements of the plates in order to explain the geological features of the earth today. Because what we see today, these uniformitarian processes, Rebecca, we see, um, we see snail pace movements of the plates. You're not going to get the necessary kind of buckling to rapidly uplift um, rock strata to create these mountains, unless you're looking at meters per second plate movements that can rapidly buckle the strata uplifting, um, these, these mountains and these geological features that we see. So uniformitarian processes, in other words, can not explain what we actually see in terms of the features of the earth. Um, so I, I like that you brought up that point. Cool. What about the distant starlight issue? I'm going to need another coffee for this one. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, that is probably their last go-to one, right? And you've heard it before. Um, first off, I'm just going to recommend that people go check out. So I did an interview with, as I pointed out earlier, maybe you watched Dr. Jason Lyle. So he's a PhD astrophysicist yeah. and he's done an incredible amount of work. He's a young earth creationist. He's done an incredible amount of work on this so-called distant starlight problem. So I had him on and I actually uh, emailed some critics and I said, send me in your best objections to his specific model dealing with distant starlight. And they did. So we had an hour and a half show and I, and, and I presented him the best so-called objections, the most technical objections you can think of, and he demolished them. So I highly recommend uh, checking that video if you think distant starlight is an issue. But what I'll say in a nutshell, and the best way I understand his model, because it does require an advanced knowledge in um, the physics of Einstein, okay? And he's actually written specifically a book dealing with the, the physics of Einstein for people who are interested. So... Um, the best way to explain it is the fact that what we know and what Einstein would agree with is that time can flow at different rates. And this basically, Rebecca, comes down to this question, how do we synchronize clocks over long distances, okay? And by long distances, I don't mean like from me to you on this earth. I'm talking about 
us having a friend hypothetically who's on Mars and we want to give him a call at noon, let's say, how do we know that his noon is my noon? And therefore, how do how exactly do we synchronize these clocks, right? Well, the answer, and believe it or not, is, and this is completely consistent with the physics of Einstein. Um, this isn't uh, pseudoscience or anything like that. This doesn't require any miracles at all, but there's actually no objective way to synchronize clocks, to measure the two-way um, speed of light. And what this means is that the one-way speed of light becomes somewhat subjective. And the way Dr. Jason Lyle uh, explains it is that when light is coming towards an observer, okay, let's say light's coming towards us or light's coming towards Adam and Eve at the creation event, it can arrive instantaneously. As in the stars we're seeing, the galaxies we're seeing, we're seeing in real time. And I know this, this sounds counterintuitive and, and it's, it's almost hard to comprehend, but it's all perfectly consistent with, um, with, with physics, with, with science. Now, light traveling away from us, going away from an observer, that can take a lot longer, obviously, than being instantaneous. All we need is one way, um, the one way speed of light coming towards us to be instantaneous. And this is the way actually uh, the ancients understood it. And I think this is the way that uh, they understood it in, in the Bible. I think this is the convention that God was using in the Bible because these lights would have had to be seen from the stars for what they were created for the function of them instantaneously for, for Adam and Eve. So yeah, when we look out in the universe and we look at the most distant star, the most distant galaxy, guess what? We're seeing it in real time. That light has hit our eyes instantaneously. And to some people, that sounds hard to understand, hard to believe. And I just recommend checking out Dr. Jason Lyle's work on it. He uh, Or watch that debate I recommended, Hugh Ross versus Jason Lyle, Rebecca. They get mm -hmm. into this distant starlight issue. And um, how do I say it in a nice way? Hugh Ross didn't do too well against uh, Jason Lyle on that topic because Jason Lyle really has figured this out. And uh, it's a really, really strong explanation, I think. So in other words, there's there's no distant starlight problem. <laughs> I hope that kind of made sense. Yeah, well, I think like um, for me, and we may disagree on this, I'm not sure, but I did hear um, Jason Lyle responding to Hugh Ross one time um, regarding like evidences for the age of the earth and he said look you know we do see some like some things that would point to and at you know that would make us you know assume that the earth is old but we also see like some evidence oh, yeah. that the earth is young and that's kind of where i am where i see distant starlight as a problem i see but i see it as a problem that's has the potential to be resolved. Right. And actually that, you know, there's other problems like, um, you know, Dr. Lyle talks about the, the problems with the evolutionary model and that there's like an equivalent of the distant starlight problem um, regarding the heat transfer in the universe. And also like, you know, we, to, in order to keep this whole model working, we're assuming dark matter and dark energy. Right. Um, and so like, you know, there's, there's like evidences on both sides. So like when I'm thinking when I, why do I believe in young earth creation? It's not because I think all the evidence supports young earth creation. Um, I think there's some evidence against it, but I do think, you know, like you've talked about today, there's, you know, a lot of evidence for a young earth. So that's just the scientific evidence. And there, it, there's some on both sides. But, you know, when I read the Bible, the, the story that I read, I, I have a very hard time putting in uh, millions of years and, and, and evolution and billions. I mean, if we're right. going by the, the, you know, model of the universe and billions, which I mean, actually the billions of years for the universe, I mean, that's not really a problem, but like when you get into millions of years of animal suffering and um, millions of years of development of 
you know, uh, ancestors to humans, that to me does not fit into the biblical text. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so like, but like the young earth thing is kind of a separate thing from evolution for me. For me, I am completely, uh, you know, I have been convinced that there is no good scientific evidence for evolution. So now that's like kind of a separate issue for me where I will be very strong against evolution where I would, you know, still admit on the young earth side that, hey, there's there's evidence for both young and right. older. So what how do you think about that? No, I think I think that's great. I, I think uh, you make a lot of good points there. And uh, I think it comes down to this. And this is a clip I have on my channel with uh, Jason Lyle and Hugh Ross. And um, I think it fits perfectly with what you with what you said is that if scientists were to come to Adam an hour after he's created, he did all these tests. Well, they're going to determine by his height, his weight, um, through genetic sequencing that he's old. But then they're going to look at uh, maybe his some blood tests, his cholesterol levels. They can uh, check the, the, his skin. They're going to find that that there's no evidence. Uh, there, there's only evidence for youth in his skin because he was just born. So in other words, what they're going to find, these scientists, are evidence that Adam is old and evidence that Adam is young. But it's the evidence that Adam is young that actually overturns the evidence that he's old. Because as long as you have one really strong, sufficient line of evidence that the earth cannot be older than whatever. With carbon dating, the earth cannot be older than a million years. Well, then there's no evolution. Or the magnetic field, the earth cannot be older than 60,000 years, right? These are like the blood tests of Adam, where these blood tests, there's no other way to explain it. I mean, these are blood tests confirm that Adam was just created an hour ago, regardless of the fact that he weighs... 160 pounds or he his height is six foot whatever you know even though today we understand that someone who's six feet or 160 pounds is not a newborn baby <laughs> you know in the same way that with adam um we would be wrong to assume that he had years and years to, to grow to that point it's the lines of evidence that wow these blood tests really confirm he was created just an hour ago also somebody in the chat digital gnosis so i want to point this out and this is why I explain, and Dr. Lyle always explains this too when it comes to this model, is it sounds counterintuitive, but it's actually perfectly consistent with the physics of Einstein. Einstein would agree with this, and anybody who understands the physics of Einstein would agree with the fact that depending on what convention you're using, and this is the way all the ancient cultures did it and viewed it, then from that convention, light takes no time at all to reach my eyes. It's literally instantaneous. Light incoming can be as fast as infinity and light outgoing can be can be different. So yeah, if we're using that convention, we are looking at distant stars and distant galaxies in real time. And I understand it sounds counterintuitive and it's complicated, but it's all scientific and understood to those who understand the physics of Einstein. And um, Dr. Lyle actually challenged uh, Dr. Hugh Ross in that debate to uh, to provide rebuttals to this model in uh, in written form. And Dr. Law would respond, and Dr. Ross, who is a brother in Christ, I, I love Hugh Ross, I just think he's wrong on the age of the earth, but he does reject universal common ancestry. Um, he has not yet responded with, with those rebuttals. Now, here's one last thing I want to point out. Rebecca, and I know we're coming at the two-hour mark here, so you know I'll start winding down. There's just so okay. much to say. There is one other model that I find interesting, and this is a model that I've argued for in the past, and it has to do with uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys. And it's called gravitational mm -hmm. time dilation. I'm not sure if you have uh, looked into this at all. But what it suggests that. Mm -hmm. is that uh, God may have created stars and galaxies while Earth itself was deep inside a gravitational time well. Now, this would have to assume that Earth was created um, at the center of, of mass or at or near the center of the universe. But we actually um, have evidence that that may be the case. So that assumption has actually kind of been validated. Uh, but anyways, what this would do is it would actually cause earth clocks to slow down or completely stop. Think of like a tent. If you had a tent and then you threw a bowling, a bowling ball in the middle of the tent, it would sink right to the bottom. 
And that would be where your uh, time dilation is occurring the most. So if Earth is created at the center of mass, it would be deep within this time well. So from the Bible, uh, the biblical perspective, God would stretch out the heavens, which we read over and over again. God stretches out the heavens. Well, what's going to come out first? Uh, what's going to come out last? The Earth would come out last of that gravitational time well, and the stars and galaxies would be stretched out and come out first. So they would have very little time dilation and the earth would have experienced a lot of time dilation. So in other words, the earth could be 6,000 years and the stars and galaxies would appear older. So from earth's perspective, it really would be, you know, 6,000 years. So that's another complicated model. It's an interesting model. Mm -hmm. I tend to lean more towards Dr. Jason Lyle's model, but there is strong evidence for uh, Dr. Russell Humphrey's model. But the point to take from it is there are different models that mm -hmm. are all pretty strong you know and, and and no model's perfect but there are young earth creationists working on on this issue and those are the two um models that i think are personally the best but i do kind of lean more towards uh, jason lyle's model go ahead cool well thank you so much for um you know being here and sharing just the work and everything that you've been doing and i just for those who joined late i want to before i ask your final question i just want to say please do go subscribe to standing for truth and uh, i put links to his website and other uh and his channels in the discussion section so uh please do that and i just want to ask you um what do you want people to know about jesus christ Good question. Good question. So, um, and I think we're in agreement here too, in that uh, we can win arguments all day. We can win arguments all day, but it's about winning souls. If we're not winning souls, you know, the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. So you can be right on everything and yet wrong on the gospel and you will die in an unregenerate state. So what I want people to know, and, and I want people to, if you're not saved yet, then uh, go read the Gospel of John or talk to Rebecca or myself and we'll be more than happy to lead you to Christ. You know, put put your, your faith and trust on Christ and his finished work alone. He paid it all. OK, we 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 can't work to be saved. We can't work to stay saved. Jesus Christ paid it all. And you can be a young earth creationist and write on all the science and not have all your faith on Jesus Christ and his finished work. And as I said earlier, you, you, you're going to die in an unregenerate state. Or you can have an old earth creationist who's right on the gospel and wrong on what I believe is the science. But the, the, the fact that they're putting their whole faith and trust on Jesus Christ, they're going to they're regenerated. They're saved. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want people to know about about uh, Jesus Christ is that and and the gospel of John is the book written that we may be saved. Go read that and you'll read over and over again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you're not yet saved, then uh, what are you waiting for? Because eternity is a long time, <laughs> okay? And we're all going to die. That's inevitable. So uh, just make sure you put your, your whole faith and, and trust on, on Christ and Christ alone. So, Cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and I appreciate everybody who has been here in the chat. And uh, I know that some of these ideas are just, you know, they're very counter to the way that we've been educated. But I really do hope that people will consider the evidence and not just believe what you've been taught. Um, and so, you know, it, it really is about critical thinking. And there's been a lot of people in the chat kind of, you know, insulting and in calling this like <laughs> stupid and ridiculous. We're used to it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I thrive We're, on it actually. I love it. I get a hundred comments a day from atheists, scoffers and and haters. And you know what? It uh, it increases my power level actually. It makes me want to do this. It motivates me. So, you know, bring on the insults and the uh, but here's the thing. Where's the rebuttals? Where's the arguments? Where's the objections? You know, insult and ad hominems, they're not going to do much to, uh, you know, improve the, this controversy and, and the dialogue surrounding itself. So. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Standing for Truth. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. God bless.